from my channel. Start in a moment, give people a chance to get on. Hello, everybody. Ready for some more OCAM today? Everybody's favorite class in all of college, right? <laughs> I am hoping. I can always hope. Bow show. <laughs> hmm. Hey, Tristan. Did you grab my pencil from earlier? Oh, no. Hang on. I think I, think I know where I put it. Hang on. I, I used my pencil this morning. I gotta grab it. I know where it's at. It's fine. Sorry about that. Um, before we get started today, do you guys have any questions about anything? You know what? Actually, yeah, I'm going to turn the light off in the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> so confused you don't know what to ask. Well, the plan I had for today was um, I wanted to go over the chromatography experiment, which is the experiment for this week. You know, remember it's not actually due till next week, but I like to go over it today. And yeah, I'm seeing here that during SI today, you guys went over some of the addition reaction stuff. Um, I was going to basically kind of deep dive a little bit today on that after we go over the chromatography lab. So yeah, let me just go and get started, guys. So I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm pulling up the uh, lab that's on Canvas. Looks like I'm lagging a little bit. Hopefully it'll stop. All right. So uh, this week in lab, we were supposed to work on uh, the chromatography experiment. And I personally feel out of all the different labs that we do uh, in 220, uh, this lab is probably the most important one for those of you that are in the medical lab science or medical lab tech programs, which I think is the majority of you. And the reason why I feel that way is because uh, chromatography uh, at, in general, the concept of it is pretty uh, ubiquitous. It's all over the place. And uh, working in a medical lab situation, you're probably, I say there's probably a 100% chance that you have a, a HPLC in there, which is a high pressure liquid chromatography. Um, actually, you know, I was at a Quest Diagnostic a few years ago, and I actually asked the lady about uh, how many HPLCs they had in the back. And this is the one over off Sahara on the west side of town. And she told me they had about four. So, yeah, it's pretty normal <laughs> to have those uh, around because they're, they're typically used for separating biological compounds. You can get all kinds of information. So uh, let's quickly go over what, what uh, chromatography is in general. 
and then I'm gonna talk about the two techniques we were going to do and how we were going to do it in lab. And I haven't finished writing up the actual assignment yet, but this week's may be a little bit different than, than what we've done in the past. All right, so uh, here are the uh, common different techniques. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know a lot of you. A lot of you are are in the MLS program. I think more than half the classes, either you're already in it or you're trying to get in it. I know the majority of you guys are that are doing that. Uh, anyway, uh, taking a look here at all the different uh, techniques here in this box here. Uh, the main uh, thing with chromatography, I'm actually going to refer to this image right here in the bottom right corner. Let me zoom in a little bit so it's just bigger. Come on, Discord. <laughs> Yeah, the notification goes like right in my bottom right corner where that image is at. <laughs> oh, hang on. Come on. There we go. So here's a little analogy I came up with when I wrote this uh, about the bees and hornets. So uh, what you can imagine here is that uh, you have a cluster of, a, of you know, two sets of insects, bees and hornets. They're both flying insects. And imagine they're flying over a bed of flowers. And then uh, typically uh, bees will tend to stop and sniff the flowers a lot more than a hornet will. Uh, so what ends up happening is that uh, over time, uh, because the hornets aren't stopping, they're going to if they were flying, suppose at the same speed, eventually they're going to separate. And the reason why is because the bees keep stopping. So you can imagine it's like someone, like you're driving down the road, one person keeps driving, one person keeps pulling over every few minutes to go to the, to go to the bathroom, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, we uh, incorporate this in uh, these in chemically, essentially, by having a stationary and mobile phase. Uh, every single chromatography technique has a stationary and mobile phase. I need to zoom out; a little blurry. Uh, so here uh, we were going to be doing uh, the first two here, and I and I mentioned earlier that uh, this third one here is really common in a medical setting. All right, so uh, we, uh, the mobile phase for the gas chromatography with an inert gas is typically either helium, argon, nitrogen, sometimes they use air. Uh, typically, it's a, it's a gas that is unreactive. It's not going to interact with your electrolytes at all. It's just pushing it through the system, just pushing it through. Uh, the stationary phase, you want it to be something that will interact with the analytes. Uh, here it's a solid phase column. I believe we had a silica gel column in, at the lab. Um, I also want to mention, uh, when, we watch, when you watch the video, the GC they, they use in the video, uh, it's actually very vintage. We're talking like 1970s, you know, range. Uh, we actually have that exact functioning GC uh, in the lab at CSN. I was going to show it to you guys. It actually has the old chart recorder, the one that has like the little pen that it moves up and down. And it, the funny thing is, it, it still works just fine. You get good data off of it. The downside is, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a computer interface, so you're doing everything manually. Um, anyway, uh, Typically for gas chromatography, it says here volatile organics. Um, from my experience, it's typically thing that are, uh, things that are lower molecular weight work a lot better on the GC than they do um, <clears throat> than the heavier ones. Heavier ones like your organic, like your uh, biological compounds, or their molecular weight's too high and they won't pass through the column, they're too heavy. So for the heavier organics, we say they're non-volatile and they, they basically are, use HPLC to, to separate them. Um, it says here that the organic solvent is uh, just organic solvent. It's typically methanol that they use uh, for hot HPLC, either straight methanol or like some ratio of like water and methanol. Uh, thin layer chromatography, you're basically running the chromatography, chromatography experiment on a plate. Um, interestingly, you can actually do uh, thin layer chromatography at home if you have construction paper and some plants. So what you can do is you can uh, take, uh, you, you typically rubbing alcohol and you can like basically crush up uh, some plant material inside of like a little Petri dish with some rubbing alcohol, uh, strain it off and actually put little drops of that on, or you can soak construction paper into that solution. And then the, the liquid will climb up the paper and you'll actually separate the pigments in the plant. And that's essentially what, what the thin layer chromatography is, except we're not using construction paper. <laughs> we actually use silica gel plates that are pre-made. Um, I actually worked in a lab in graduate school where we made our own TLC plates. That was a learning experience. Uh, it was actually pretty fun. Uh, basically what we would do, we take, we would take a long sheet of really thin glass, and then we would, we would make a solution of hexane and silica gel, stir it up, 
And then one person would pour it on the glass and the other person would have like a little spatula to flatten it. And then uh, we'd let it sit and dry, you know, all day and the next day come back and then we would get a little glass cutter and cut our little plates out of it. I don't know, I thought it was fun. It's time consuming though. It's much, it's much easier just to buy them. But our, my professor was very, very old school. So he, we did everything as old fashioned as possible in this lab, because that's just how he was. So I learned a lot from that lab though, honestly, because like, yeah, the instrumentation came later basically uh, for that point of view. All right, so uh, let's take a look at what the actual experiment was uh, for this. Uh, remember, if you guys have any questions about this, you are more than welcome to stop me. All right, so uh, here, uh, here is a, a sample uh, of like a TLC plate. And you'll see this in the video too, but typically what you would do, yep. Uh, typically what you would do here is uh, you would draw a line with a pencil. And I, I'm usually really adamant about this in lab. It says, so, it says so in the procedure too. You cannot use pen for this line. You, it has to be a pencil. Does anybody want to give me a reason why it has to be pencil and not pen? Anybody? For thin layer chromatography, why do you think it has to be a pencil and not a pen? And I'll, I'll usually do a run with pen and show you why it's bad. Um, so the answer, first answer was correct mistakes. Nope. So the thing is, if you actually make a mistake on these TLC plates, you have to start over. Because if you actually etch, etch into the silica with, by writing on it and you make a mistake, you have to just toss it out and get a new one. So it actually works out uh, because we're using an organic solvent uh, and your ink is organic, you'll actually separate the pigment on the ink and it'll, your, your ink will actually run up the plate. You don't, want your ink to, you don't want your line to go up the plate. <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you use a pen, depending, depending on the pen, uh, the ink will actually slide up and I'll, Whenever we do this in the lab, I'll actually do a run with ink to show you guys that you can get different colored pigments in ink. Um, but if you use pen, a pencil, it turns out the charcoal and the pencil does not move at all with the organic solvent. Uh, anyway, um, here, uh, some students like to draw a line at the top too. Uh, this is how far they're going to let the solvent run at the plate before they stop. And I recommend students don't draw this line and just let it go to kind of just eyeball it. You know, it's near the top. Just don't let it go over the top. And uh, it also works out that the, the farther you let it go, the better your data is in general. So just however long you think you need. Uh, some people let it go to like here. I don't recommend letting go that, you know, that little bit of time. But if you're in a rush, like, oh no, there's only five minutes of lab left. I gotta, I gotta hurry up. I'll, I'll let students pull it out like super early, like right here and it's fine. Their data will be not as good, but we're in a rush. So if you have the time, let it run all the way to the top. It takes about 10, 15 minutes for it to happen. Um, while that's happening, we also keep it in, I have a picture of a chamber up here. Let me scroll up. Uh, typically, you know, it's a very, very uh, high tech uh, setup here. It's a beaker with a watch glass. It's so high tech. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in the lab, we actually have a special glassware for TLC chambers. But honestly, a beaker and a watch glass is all you need. Uh, the only thing different is that if uh, this picture is not the best, best picture here, but if you're using a beaker, because they have that little lip opening on it, uh, you have to worry about your, your organic solvent evaporating. So what you do typically if you're using a beaker is you'll add a paper towel to it that's soaked in the solvent to keep the, the, air, the air in there soaked in solvent particles. So you, it won't dry out as easy, essentially. Uh, with a TLC chamber, it's fully enclosed when you put the lid on, so you don't have to do, put the paper towel in there. So whatever. Whichever one, they're, they're both just as easy to use. Adding a paper towel takes like two, minute, like two seconds, so not a big deal. I, I always do use them with the beaker. This is what I learned. This is a habit. All right, um, for this experiment, what you were going to do, oh, let me go back to this real quick. I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun here a little bit. Uh, here, uh, so there is, there is a calculation for this, and it's basically a ratio of how far your spot goes to uh, how far the solvent went. And as long as the solvent conditions are identical, if you don't get the exact distance for D solve here, it won't, it won't matter because the ratio will be the same. So what I mean by is like, suppose one run I had to go all the way up here and then one run I had to go only up to here. Uh, calculating the RF, which I gave the equation right here, is just the ratio. Um, it works out the same no matter how far it goes. As long as your solvent conditions are the same and you're in the same kind of plate. All right.
So you guys were going to uh, basically take uh, a couple standards. And uh, because this is, uh, so if you're in 241, these are pre-made. If, if you are in 220, I have you guys make these. And the reason why I have you guys make these is because it's part of the process, medical lab science, you should know, you should know how to make solutions. It's pretty basic uh, chemical lab skills to have. Uh, anyway, what you were going to do is you were going to take each of these analgesics. And uh, I hope you guys know what the word analgesic means. It means a painkiller, fever reducer. And these are all over the counter. So we have acetaminophen, aspirin, caffeine, and salicylamide. And depending on the brand that you're buying, they'll have different ones and various combinations of them. Uh, caffeine is, an, is a common addition to like migraine uh, headache medicine. Uh, anyway, uh, you also had a, uh, there was a fifth spot here. Uh, typically our plates aren't wide enough for this. So typically what I have students do is I can do a three and a two plate and then each student runs one individually and then they just share data. Uh, but the, one, of, one of the samples was an unknown and the unknown contained two unknowns and you have to use the RF values from the standards to figure out the identity of the unknowns. Does that make sense to everybody? So first what you do is you run the standards here for all the different four, you get their, you calculate their RF values, and then you do the same thing for your unknown, which had two of them in there, and you get to figure out which two of the four were in there. All right. And here, yeah, here's my little, my little uh, Microsoft Paint illustration. <laughs> I know someone's going to give you a hard time for Microsoft Paint. Uh, I actually did all the artwork in this lab manual in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> it's this easy software to use, but it's, it's, it's not the best quality because of it. So, <laughs> but yeah, there's a little setup there. Um, the other procedure we, we were going to do was uh, gas chromatography. Um, this is actually an instrument. So uh, what I would do, I actually typically pre-make samples here and you uh, essentially have, uh, it's a sample that has three different alcohols in it. It's, uh, I believe it's ethanol, propanol, butanol uh, that we have in there. And uh, the, it turns out because they have slightly different polarity and molecular weights, they end up separating on the column as a result. Um, here, so basically uh, we inject through a, through a rubber septum it goes through a heater, which uh, the heater is typically pretty hot. We keep ours, I remember, remember right, it was like 200 degrees C, roughly. It's like 200 to 250 degrees C. It's enough to instantly vaporize any solvent you put in there. And then the, the, the helium gas is pushing, uh, pushing the, through the system. Let me zoom in on this. Yeah, I have... This image, I didn't, I didn't draw this image. I appropriated it from Shuttershock. So <laughs> that was, this one was I, I started drawing it. I was like, ah, I'm just gonna borrow it. Uh, anyway, you push the helium gas through, it goes through an oven. It's literally an oven. You know, you could bake cookies in it if you wanted to. Um, the, the thing about this oven, it, it allows us to set ramp rates. You typically don't have a ramp rate setting on your home oven. Uh, basically it's a starting point and then over time it goes up and we, we can control the rate. And that uh, method is basically a lot of uh, troubleshooting. There, there isn't really a good way to predict like your exact method. Uh, just over the years at CSN, we came up with a method that worked out really well for this experiment. Uh, each run would take about two minutes. Um, I do want to mention here drug testing because I know a lot of you guys are medical lab science. You might be doing drug testing sometime in the future. Uh, this, if you're, getting, if you're going to a lab that is not doing a like urinalysis, like a standard like P-cup test, uh, chances are they're doing a GC method. And uh, typically what they do is uh, uh, they'll take your urine and uh, the solvent is decane. Uh, you treat the urine with decane and that actually pulls out drug metabolites from urine. And then they inject that, uh, the decane sample, they do like drying steps and all that too to make sure there's no water in it to get all the water out of it. Uh, but they run that through the GC and then you actually see different metabolites showing up. And the thing about those kind of drug tests compared to a normal drug test is that you can't fool the GC. That's why some people do use, use, use uh, lab testing because you can't fool it. So for example, you were one of those people that, oh, you go to the smoke shop, they have those drinks that you can use to like pass a, pass a test for you know, marijuana, whatever drug you're trying to pass the test for. And what you'll see on the GC, you'll actually see like whatever agent was trying to mask it and then THC right next door on the, on the chromatogram. You can't fool it. 
only THC showed up at that spot because they ran a standard that told them exactly that compound comes out at exactly that time. So they're, they're, and they're also doing mass spectrometry which they can use to confirm the identity of that compound. So there was without a shadow, it was 100% confirmed that if you have that spike in your urinalysis, you use that drug at some point. So you can't fool the GC. <laughs> um, hair tests are actually done the same way. Um, they typically will do, well, will, will do a, di a digestion process, process on the hair first, and then they'll treat it, treat it with decane. After they make that, that like, hair mush solution, they like dissolve the hair up and yeah, and they, they basically work it up in an organic solvent. It's similar. Um, I know there are other methods out there. That's what our lab was doing for this kind of thing. Was uh, we were doing the decane workup, which is a, which is a common like method that people follow. All right. Um, any questions so far about GC? Yeah. Usually uh, in class, this erupts to uh, my 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 moral dilemma with drug testing. How I feel it's an invasion of privacy. But we'll leave it at that. That that's how I feel about drug testing, it, unless unless they're doing it at the workplace. But if they're doing it pre-hire, I think I think um, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> but we would this would normally be like a 10-minute discussion in, in class <laughs> about the morality of drug testing. Yeah, the short version is: if a person is able to perform the job and not be a hazard at the workplace. You shouldn't care what they do on the weekend. That should be their business, not yours. But uh, anyway, um, I want to talk a little bit about this here. So this is how typically how the data looks. So uh, each one of these peaks in a, in, they call it a chromatogram, is a plot of your, on the y-axis, it's a response of your instrument, typically like millivolts or something. It's often millivolts. And then on the x-axis is time. We call it retention time. And the reason why we call it re retention time is because that's how long it took to come off the column. And it's actually mentioned right here. Yeah, it's time it took for it to come off the column is on the x-axis, retention time. So typically what they'll do, uh, when I was talking about standard earlier, is uh, they'll basically use uh, GC information to uh, determine what each peak is. And they're, if they're following the same standard method, the different metabolites always show up at the exact same retention time. And then if they're, if, and then they typically will double click it and then that pulls the mass, mass chromatogram of that. And I don't, I don't want to go over mass spec with you guys, but it is a way for us to confirm identity of compounds in organic chemistry. They're basically uh, fingerprints for compounds. Every compound has a different fingerprint. Um, here, um, so this, uh, this I, I had to add this discussion in there. So when I was writing this manual, I was kind of emulating the process that I saw in other manuals. I noticed very few talked about bad data. <laughs> so this discussion here is talking about bad data. And uh, unfortunately, uh, GCs are, ex are notoriously finicky and require, at least in my experience, they require constant troubleshooting to get to look right. So uh, here, uh, this is a really good peak. It's nice and narrow. It turns out that sometimes your compound will drag on the column and, don't, and not all come out together. So realistically, you want your compound to come out like as, a, as a thin band coming off the GC, but sometimes portions of it will lag behind on the column and not all come off together. And we call that telling. And that basically, uh, it makes, makes that signal seem unusually large. So you see here how I have a, let me zoom in on this again. Yep, so there we, uh, we're seeing the telling effect. I'm kind of drawing a line so uh, what I would have you guys do in lab is uh, if you had telling on your data, uh, you would basically approximate what a, tr what a nice clean triangle would have looked like with that. So I kind of just drew the line here and then you would use that triangle as your peak and not this whole thing. Because uh, if you actually do the math for this and calculate uh, this as part of like the base of your triangle, you are grossly overestimating the size of this peak. Um, if, if you're using if you're using a, an instrument like a comp computer for your data, uh, you basically would uh, the computer does integration. If, if you haven't taken calculus yet, integration is called area it's area under the curve, and it, it does a numerical method to, to accurately determine this area under the curve. It works out if you read the, if you read the thing here. It basically talks about how the the area under the curve for the peak is proportional to its percent composition. So uh, keep that in mind when working on this. Uh, here's another uh, bad data thing that shows up sometimes. 
Uh, this is basically where you don't get a, a clean separation and the two compounds are kind of overlapping in the data. So here, we, th these are two peaks like this. And it's showing you here how to approximate it. And typically what causes this is one of them is trailing or telling, sorry. Uh, so this peak is telling into this one. So when you do the approximation, uh, th this line isn't the best way. I would just draw, continue this line straight down and then this one continue it straight down like that. Make them triangles, basically. All right. So uh, I mentioned a moment ago that, uh, you know, you were going to use, you know, or if, if you use a computer, the computer will tell you, you know, basically what the integration is. But we go very old school in this, this, this lab. So in this lab, what I have you guys do, I know it sounds really uh, silly, but it, it actually, it's actually high, very accurate. You would actually cut out the peaks, the scissors, and weigh the paper that you cut out. That, that is your peak. Uh, the reason why that is that is highly accurate is because if you're doing if you're a, saying that your peak is a triangle like for example this peak right here we're, we're making the assumption it's a triangle uh, you're actually underestimating because you're not including that part so by cutting the peak out you're actually including all of it and you're not you're very it's very low approximation and the main thing that why it works, once again, is because the weight of the paper is proportional to the area of that curve. So what you would do then is you would use those uh, mass values as if they were uh, area values, and the math works out to be correct. Are there any questions about that so far? All right. Um, so moving along here, uh, this is the, uh, so this lab has a lot of calculations. So uh, you're also going to need a ruler. So hopefully you guys have a ruler for this lab. You know what, actually, um, now that I think about it, um, I'm just going to give you guys the data um, instead of having to measure them out. Uh, so uh, the other method we do with this, this lab is I have you guys determine area by the, tri the triangulation method. So the triangulation method is where you actually measure the physical space, the physical area of that peak on your graph paper. In, I typically tell, tell students to use centimeters for that, that distance. And then you calculate the area of a triangle and you use those area values. After you have each individual area, you can, you can calculate the percent area by taking the area of the peak, and, or it could be the, in, in the case, if it was, if you weren't using, the, if you're using the weighing method, it would be mass numbers here instead, or area, remember they're kind of the same in this lab area and masses of the papers are considered equivalent. So yeah, the mass or area of peak one divided by the total area times 100% would give you percent A. All right, uh, there's, there's a percent volume discussion in there too that you have to look through. Area of a triangle. I'm hoping you remember your high school geometry. I'm hoping you guys learned, remember, learned this in high school probably. Area of a triangle. And then lastly, we have percent error calculation. Uh, you should have did this calculation back in general chemistry. Uh, so I want you guys to, you're going to be calculating percent volumes by, I'm going to tell you the amount of each of the different alcohols, like one mil, one mil, one mil of each. And you got to calculate a percent volume of each and then use that as your true value. And then your measured value is going to be what you calculated from this one. So that's how you're going to get a percent error calculation. It should, it should work out where your, your mass calculation is better than the triangulation method. We'll see. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm still working on writing it up, but you're, um, I am going to give you guys numbers here to work with. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to give you guys uh, solvent distance. And so I'll, I'll put here like the solvent front distance and I'll fill in each of these distance lines. And you have to calculate RF. And then I'll fill in some, some uh, ones here for your unknowns. And you have to figure out which ones they were based off what you did over here. So... All right, sorry, I didn't mean to talk so long on this topic, but this is actually a pretty important lab and I wanna make sure you guys are understanding everything here. Yeah, so I will just provide data for uh, both of these experiments and then you will just fill in the calculations. And then uh, from, for the write-up today, we're, I'll, I'll write it up in the procedure that I'm writing, I'm working on, but we're gonna, we're, you're not gonna write a procedure from the video this time. So I, I had you guys writing procedures from video last time 
or for the previous labs, for this lab, and uh, I'm gonna have you guys pretend that we did the experiment and then uh, uh, use your data. So you're not, no procedure write-up, but there's gonna be a, a write-up. Basically, I want you guys to explain to me what your data means, essentially. Like, what does the data mean? What does it tell us? Is that making sense, guys? So this week's lab, once again, to make sure everything's clear, you're, you are not writing a procedure. I'm gonna give you data, and you're gonna basically tell me what, what your data means and explain to me how, how chromatography works. All right, so yeah, if you have any questions about anything. But yeah, I ran a little bit long on this lecture here, but yeah, it's important for you guys. So. Nope, okay. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch gears here a little bit and uh, start talking some arrow pushes, some carbon stuff. <coughs> Just be debating in my brain which order I want to go in. Um, I think I want to start off with oxymercuration. Let's do that. All right, so let's switch over to the doc cam. Come on. Hang on, my camera's crooked. I think I made it worse. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's better. All right. Yeah, my mouse cord is in the way. All right. So uh, last time we did some hydration reactions. I want to do another hydration here. But we're going to change it up a little bit. I was using just one propene last time. Here, we're going to use this one and do the mechanism. So hydration, acid catalyzed. Yeah, so uh, the question was about the spinach lab. Um, I'm dropping that out. It, it, it was gonna be too much writing. So uh, yeah, no, we're, uh, it's TLC and GC only. Yep, TLC and GC only. All right. And it's not cool, it's coo. C-O-O-H, come on. <laughs> I made a thing for it in the Discord if you guys didn't know yet. Hang on, let me do it. There you go, it's coo. <laughs> yeah, that's, I did that. If you guys didn't know that, yeah, that's in there. It's coo. Uh, remember here, uh, so uh, first things first you want to think about is uh, which carbon is the H, which carbon is the plus. Remember, you want the plus to go more substituted. So plus goes here. That means that new H is on this carbon. We originally had two. We now have three. I'm not going to draw them in. You guys should know this by now. All right. Uh, I typically only draw an H's if they're relevant. So I'm actually going to draw an H here. And the reason why is because I have to think about, okay, we have a carbocation can we have any kind of alkyl or hydride shifts? So this is gonna undergo a shift, hydride shift. And the driving force behind this is that we're gonna get a more stable carbocation like that. And this one leads to the major product, not this one. Uh, you may have a trace amount of this one leading the product, but honestly, major is from this one. Uh, next up here is a nu nucleophilic attack, just like SN1. Remember, after, uh, at this point, after the carbocation forms, it's pretty much the, exactly the same as SN1. The only difference is how we start it. So nucleophilic attack, like that. And then I mentioned last time the step that students commonly uh, forget. I'm gonna show you guys the, the joke I didn't show you guys uh, last time. I totally forgot to show you guys this. Now you're never gonna forget this. Don't forget about Rudolph. <laughs> I see Rudolph when I draw that. The red-nosed reindeer. All 
All right. Uh, next step here is uh, deprotonation, like that. There we go. All done. All right. Uh, so the problem now is is uh, okay. Uh, what if we actually purposely want the product where we didn't get the rearrangement? We, we want this not to happen. We want the OH to go here. We're so we're dead set on that. We want the OH to go here. Uh, there are a couple ways to do that. Um, the main one I want you guys to be aware of is oxymercuration, demercuration. Mercuration, demercuration, and the conditions you're going to see on the arrow. Uh, for this uh, reaction, the first step is mercury one, or mercury two acetate, and water, and typically an organic solvent to go along with it. And then uh, step two is a reducing agent NaBH4. And I'm going to specifically mention this one here. Uh, their names. Uh, let me put their names here. Uh, let's use purple. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, for those of you guys that don't, uh, haven't had me in the past, I actually shorthand acetate as OAC. Uh, you may remember this from general chemistry as C2H3O2 minus. And then uh, we actually did this acetate ion during the uh, Lewis structure discussion back early in the semester. It's basically acetic acid missing the H. It's that. Uh, this one here in the bottom is the reagent we're going to see a couple times this semester. It's very common. It's called sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride. And this is a reducing agent. And I want to mention here it's a mild reducing agent. We're going to get a little bit into redox today. So I'll go over a little bit what redox is in organic chemistry. But for now, just know it's a mild reducing agent. All right, so uh, what I want to do, uh, so uh, if you actually watch the video, I think I do the mechanism. I'm not doing it here. I recommend that you watch it at least. I'm not testing on the mechanism, but I want you to know the intermediates. So I want you to know what happens in step one and then how that reacts to step two. So uh, what happens here without going through the mechanism is uh, the mercury, uh, there's a step in the mechanism that prevents rearrangement. So the, we're going to say step one was the mercury acetate and water. What ends up happening here is without a rearrangement, your alcohol group goes here. And then the mercury piece is here. Like that. So I want to add this note here. Is that the OH and mark position. And then here, the mercury goes anti-mark. Less substituted. All right, and then uh, what the next step does, it, it basically just uh, trades out this big whole group for just an H, to getting us our alcohol group back. So the reducing step, this is a reduction. And for the sake of completion of the note, this is the symbol for reduction in organic chemistry is that. With brackets with an H, no plus in there though, no plus in there. But this means reducing step. Whenever you see that symbol. Like that, and we are not gonna worry about mass balance here. We're just gonna worry about the organic part. So once again, the point of this is to Get the product without a rearrangement. So no rearrangement here. Any questions on this? Any questions at all? Nope. 
All right. All right, so the next one I wanted to go over here was, I want to go over Bromination real quick and Sin versus, sin versus Anti-Edition. Uh, so quickly, uh, so we have Sin versus Anti-Edition. And then we're going to go over a couple reactions with this. And I'm going to go ahead and use a ring for my example. I, I think it's most apparent in rings. So sin means same side. So suppose we're adding groups X and Y. X and Y would be in the same direction for a sin addition. And then you can probably guess what anti is. Anti addition is where you have the groups pointing in opposite directions. So we're going to have this. X and then Y, like that. And then for both of these, uh, you may have the enantiomer too. Uh, typically, when people are saying that and the enantiomer, it's like plus EN. So once again, same, same direction, sin, opposite direction, anti. So not only are you going to have to be able to predict products, you're also going to have to tell me whether it was sin or anti. I look for that on some of them. Uh, thankfully, some of them are racemic. So uh, the question I have for you guys right now, uh, do you think that this reaction, uh, this reaction we did earlier, do you think this is going to be a sin or anti addition or both? So if, you're, if it's a sin addition, if it's, if it's both sin and anti, you can say your product is racemic. Would you expect your product to be, be racemic in this problem if, if you had a chiral center at the end? What do you guys think? The, the key to answering that question correctly is the carbocation. Think about SN1. Sin or anti, guys? What do you think? Racemic is a correct guess. Yes. Yeah, so the, remember back during the SN1 chapter, uh, we saw that these carbocations lead to racemic products when you, have, when you have nucleophilic attack. And also remember from today that at, after this point, this is basically SN1 now. So it works out where you get racemic products here. So I'm going to add that note in here. Racemic. And we're going to say, say the same thing for both. I don't want to get into, into the Sterichem talk of this one. For now, we're, we're just going to go ahead and say racemic, racemic for this one also, just to keep it simple. All right. So here, looking at this here, uh, so we have our first uh, set of reactions here. So I want, I want to go over bromination, hydrogenation, and oxidations today. So... We're going to go a little bit over than usual, so I'm thinking an hour and a half maybe. Then we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, if I'm not doing mechanisms, it might go pretty quick. I mean, I'm used to doing this discussion with doing the mechanisms too, but I don't want to do all that this semester. So uh, just because I want the notes to, cl to clearly illustrate sin versus anti, I'm going to do all the notes with this compound for this part. Just Because uh, rings in particular very clearly illustrate sin versus anti, I just want to make sure you guys are understanding, though, that you can have sin and anti for straight chains, too. They're just very, very obvious when it's a ring. So for the notes, let's do that. All right, and I'm going to actually change this just a little bit just to make it so it's asymmetric, and we'll have to consider that, too. So the, this is a bromination. We're going to go over. So this is basically BR2 and organic solvent. Uh, the most common ones that are used for this is dichloromethane is most commonly done for this. CH2, Cl2. It could also be chloroform. I've seen it in chloroform before. Uh, chloroform has toxicity problems, so uh, people try to avoid it. But 
So does dichloromethane. Uh, the one I mentioned, well, I'm thinking of dichloromethane is uh, typically if uh, you're in lab, I'll, I'll usually ask the ladies if they're if any of them are pregnant because I try to minimize your exposure to this compound. We use it a lot in the lab uh, for our experiments. And apparently this has been found to cause birth defects uh, with, with, with uh, unborn children. So yeah, just to avoid that, yeah, any pregnant, pregnant women get to, get to hang out at the, at the bench and just watch the experiment during these ones when we use that. They get to hang back and just watch. All right, so uh, what ends up happening here is we get the bromines adding like this. So notice how, I, so the way I typically draw these products here is I'll draw these groups first and it works out where bromination is anti-addition. Uh, the mechanism explains why, I don't wanna go through it here. I'm not gonna be testing on the mechanism anyway. But any, uh, how you predict products though is you wanna draw them anti and then just draw the other group whatever, whatever way it was going or should be going. So if this one was a wedge, the other one has to be a dash. Uh, same thing here as well. So I'm drawing the enantiomer now. So if I have methyl like that, that means that bromine must be like that. And then if it's anti-addition, if bromine is down, other bromine is up. Like that. All right. Uh, so the, the reason why I specified organic solvent is because another type of condition you may see for this is if it's in water, you get, you get a different product here. So if in water, so Br2 in water, you're, you're going to get a Br and an OH, and they are anti as well. Uh, it works out where the OH goes more substituted. So I'm gonna choose uh, this carbon to be the carbon that's gonna get the methyl. I know the OH is gonna go there. So OH, that means the BR must be down as a dash. And then if this one here, the other group that's already on there, the methyl is like that. So I'm gonna do this again, just make sure we're practicing how to predict products. I, I always mention these the little tips to do this correctly in class. So once again, I'm choosing that carbon to be the more substituted carbon. If I make the OH a dash, that means the other bromine must be a wedge because they're anti. And then that means that this one here, if the OH is on dash, the methyl must be on wedge. Like that. Um, on a test situation, I'd be okay if you drew one that said plus EN. Um, but, but for the notes, I like to draw them all out as we're getting, we're getting our practice. But yeah, on a test, you can go ahead and just write plus EN. And anti-addition, they add opposite. Do or do. Oh. All right. Questions about bromination. I'll talk about industry applications after I go over hydrogenation next. Yeah, bro, uh, the question was about sin. Uh, bromination is anti-addition, 100% on that. <laughs> it's anti. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the mechanism. Uh, they're, the, they're the intermediate where uh, it shows that it has to be anti. You have you have an SN2-like step in there. You'll see if you haven't watched it yet, but it, it goes over in detail. I don't want to do it here. I'm focusing on how to get right answers right now. All right, so I, I said I want to do hydrogenation next. So hydrogenation... I think out of all the reactions that we cover in this chapter, this is probably the most industry applicable one. It's pretty important in, in industry. So uh, the short version of this is alkenes or alkynes, basically your pi bonds. And then we'll have H2 and then we'll have a metal catalyst I'm doing the very generic version here, and then we'll do the specifics. Metal catalyst, it gives you an alkane. That's the short version of it. So basically what's happening here is uh, we have the, you know, the double bonds. You're basically just plugging the two H's on, on them and making it saturated. 
Uh, the way they plug on there, though, uh, is thin, because uh, typically the way this works is uh, you'll have palladium or platinum. So a palladium is a common one. And it turns out that like when, so here we have an H2 molecule like that. Imagine this coming in. Eventually what'll happen is it'll stick on there like this. And then what happens is when the al when we, we throw the alkene in or alkyne is it's gonna add on the same face. Like this, it's gonna come down, boop. They stick on the same face, same, same time. We're gonna get a thin addition. So thin addition is the other note you want here. And we're, don't worry, we're gonna do some, some actual problem. I wanted to explain how the chemistry is working here. So once again, we're basically plugging the H's onto there on the same side. And I do wanna add uh, here, uh, benzene is aromatic. Benzene does not hydrogenate easily. So benzene requires high temperature and pressure to hydrogenate. The word is hydrogenate. Sorry, I had a text. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let's take a look at some examples here. So uh, the reagent here is H2, uh, palladium, nickel, or platinum. Any of these work, uh, depending on which book you're using, they may use different ones. I'll let you guys know though, the most common one in the lab is this one, palladium. Uh, it works out where there's actually like a, there's a cost -ish, a situation here. It works, it works out where platinum is actually the best at doing this, but it's platinum. <laughs> it's valuable. So uh, it works out where uh, palladium kind of follows the middle ground where in terms of cost and effectiveness. So it ended up being like the sweet spot for price and getting the right results. Um, I want to show you guys something though. I need to find a correct table. I know I had one here. Whatever. Um, if you guys look at a periodic table, it works out where these, these three elements are actually in the same column. Remember from freshman chemistry that uh, elements in the same column have similar chemistry. So it works out that these three metals can serve as a catalyst because they have similar chemistry. Um, anyway, we get an alkane from that. <clears throat> it works out uh, because we have a syn addition. Uh, uh, this comes into play if you have a ring. So for example here, let's go ahead and draw a compound like this. And then we say H2 palladium, that's PD. Uh, what ends up happening here is the H's will go on the same side. So, oh, I have, I have a question for you guys now. Let's see if you guys remember your stereochemistry stuff. So the question is, should I write plus EN for this problem? Once again, the question was, should I write plus EN for this problem? Let's see what you guys think. Nope. It's miso. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if, the comp, uh, if the compound wasn't miso, I would have said plus en, but in the case of this one, it's miso. So you don't really have to do that. But in most cases, you're probably gonna write plus en if it's chiral. Yeah. But the main thing I want you guys to see here is it's a syn addition. If you had the methyl groups going like this, then that would have been an anti addition because the H's would have been anti to each other. All right. Uh, one of the uh, issues with this stuff here is uh, if you use an alkyne, let me show this here. Alkyne, we have a triple bond. Uh, this one was an alkene. 
Now we have an alkyne. You're not gonna see an alkyne in a ring, so I, I can't do that. <laughs> Alkynes are typically not in rings because of angle strain. But H2 palladium, uh, what turns out here is actually, you, you, if you wanted to, uh, you, sorry, let me stop for a second there. You can't control this reaction here. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to step it down from like an alkyne to an alkene, these conditions don't work. It turns out that this fully reduces down to this. So once uh, the note here, once again, is we get full reduction. The symbol we use for that is the H with the brackets, 2N alkane. So what would happen here is the alkene would form and then that would react with the, the hydrogen again. It's too reactive, we can't stop it here. And you can't see it. I'm not sure what you can't see. Is my stream lagging? I don't know. Oh, I moved the page. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking I was lagging or something. <laughs> it's all good. All right, there we go. <laughs> all right, understood. So uh, if you want to stop the reduction at the alkene, we have two ways to do that. And I want you guys to have both of them in your notes. And let's go ahead and do it here. So uh, what we call, uh, this next thing here is called poison catalyst to stop at an alkene. So poisoned catalyst to stop at the alkene. So uh, I'm gonna show you guys two ways and then we're gonna move on to the next topic of discussion. So here we have, uh, let's go ahead and say the first one is H2 and palladium. Same so far, except now what we do is we add calcium carbonate to it. It turns out what calcium carbonate will make the palladium a less effective catalyst. That's why it's called a poison catalyst. We, we, we purposely made it weaker by adding calcium carbonate to it. This is typically known as Linlar's catalyst. You may see that often people, people will just write Linlar's. This is what they're saying. It's palladium with calcium carbonate on it. Um, I, from what I understand, they take a calcium carbonate deposit and like kind of like put the metal on over, like mix it in there somehow. I'm not quite sure. I've never actually seen it personally. I've actually, I've done hydrogenation before, but not the poison ones before. Uh, what this does is we get that. So we get a Z alkene from this because the group are on Z zame side, right? We get a Z alkene. And then the other conditions here, uh, I'm gonna have two different ways because I know the textbooks are kind of waffling between the two, depending on which book you're using. So the one I learned was sodium metal with ammonia was the way I learned it. And some textbooks show it that way, but I've noticed a lot of newer textbooks are showing this more modern way, which is lithium metal, which ironically is in the same family of sodium. So it makes sense to me. And instead of using ammonia, they use ethylamine, ETNH2. I'm having a feeling that this one is safer in the lab. I've worked with liquid, uh, this is liquid ammonia too, by the way, like not aqueous, it's pure ammonia. And for this one, we will selectively get the E alkene. I'm gonna do some uh, synthesis problems tomorrow. This is uh, synthesis problems. You can ask Natalie about this. But uh, synthesis problems are the bane of organic chemistry students. It, it basically, it's, it's hard for people. So basically what, uh, what synthesis is, is you can imagine I'm teaching you guys chess moves. These are all chess moves and tools you can use. And then I ask you to play chess. What moves do you do to get to here, essentially? Uh, that'll be next time. We'll start, we'll start doing a little bit of that next time. But we, yeah, we do, uh, for, for the SI person, we do a little bit of synthesis in this class, but it's not a lot. Not like we did in 242. All right, um, any questions on this before we move on? I wanna talk about some industry uh, discussion here too a little bit.
Yes. If you are a, a fan of puzzles, you will love organic chemistry. I think, I think that's why I, I think that in the art is why I got drawn to organic chemistry. I like doing puzzles and I also like doing art. So I think that's why I naturally gravitated towards it. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about um, some biology here. Your, uh, your chem professor knows a little bit of biology, right? <laughs> All right, so uh, here I'm representing a fatty acid. And I'm going to go ahead and draw the carboxylic acid group on here. So essentially, uh, fatty acids are uh, really long carbon chains, like 18 carbons is pretty normal. And then we have this carboxylic acid group. So the question I have for you guys now, what do you guys think? Is this, is this a saturated or unsaturated fat? I don't, I want to move, yeah, so we, we can see here that it's unsaturated. It's pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, it, it works out where at, at room temperature, typically uh, unsaturated fats are liquids. So this is unsaturated. And what people do to this is they will basically hydrogenate it. So H2 and palladium is often used. And we basically get just alkane chain. So this portion here is an alkane, long carbon chain, and then now we say it's a saturated fat. So uh, typically, the uh, way this is marketed, like, or, or on an ingredient label, if, if they actually have like a synthetic saturated fat, it'll say uh, typically like where it's from like a vegetable or a hydrogenated vegetable oil would be a, an example. Hydrogenated vegetable oil. Unfortunately, uh, our industry likes to do other things that aren't quite as nice, but they get some similar results. So one thing that industry does is they, they brominate instead. So industry can brominate instead. Um, that is not as good because uh, brominated uh, fatty acids are definitely not naturally occurring. And uh, this is really common in citrus beverages. So uh, if you ever, uh, the, the big culprit I'm thinking of is Mountain Dew. So Mountain Dew, if you look on the ingredient label, it says brominated vegetable oil. Uh, brominated vegetable oil has been linked to kidney disease. So uh, watch your Mountain Dew intake, guys. It's not just the sugar that's bad for you. It's the phosphoric acid and the brominated vegetable oil also. Yeah, so watch out. I, like, I recommend if you drink Mountain Dew, cut it cold turkey. That stuff is nasty. If you're gonna drink soda, drink something else. Yeah, I always say that orange soda, orange soda and Mountain Dew are the worst. And it's, and it's not just the sugar. Uh, they are. They also have brominated vegetable oil in there. And from what I understand, from what I read, uh, the reason why they do they they use that version, it's not necessarily the cost. It has to do with like the the drink itself. Like a, apparently some of those artificial citrus flavorings, uh, they don't homogenize easily. And if you can imagine, if you had, if you went and bought a soda that wasn't homogenous, you wouldn't buy it. Basically, if it had floaties on the top, yeah, exactly. Uh, the the comment was it was nasty. It was nasty before the brominated information. Yes, I agree. <laughs> that just adds to the list of why it's bad for you. Yeah, don't get me going on, on tooth decay and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's bad. It's rotten for your teeth. You are literally making a perfect breeding ground for bacteria growth by drinking a soda. It's so bad for you. All right. Uh, any questions? I want to bring this up. Uh, so one thing, uh, a quick thing that I want to mention about fatty acids in general, just because you know it's, it's, you guys are biology-ish majors. Um, typically, you, you may have heard the name like omega-3 and omega-6. Uh, that's actually technically a biblical reference. Uh, there's a few biblical references in chemistry. This is one of them. Uh, so you guys may have heard the, say, the saying from the Bible, uh, alpha, I'm alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, essentially, what if you, if you see omega numbering, they're numbering from the end of the chain, not the beginning. So uh, omega numbering means you're numbering from this way, uh, from the end of the chain. So what it means for, this is omega-3 fatty acid. It means that your fatty acid sequence or the, the unsaturated sequence starts uh, three carbons in. 
Uh, the way we typically see fatty uh, double bonds in fatty acids is they will be like uh, one spacer between them. So oftentimes they'll be like this and then so on. Uh, what people, uh, so what happens, these are not in conjugation. So they are not in conjugation. And from what I understand, uh, be, be, if they were in conjugation, it would be harder for enzymes to eat them. Uh, from what I understand, these are chew points for, uh, bacteria, uh, for our enzymes to, to eat these molecules up and start metabolizing them. These are chew points. And apparently if you uh, add trans fats into the situation, uh, trans fats are basically, uh, they, they typically aren't naturally occurring. And what trans fats are is they are partial hydrogenation. So it, it turns out that if you heat these up in, in uh, you know, your frying pan or a deep fat fryer, there's a, trans, there's a chance for them to, to basically go from a cis to a trans. And that's, that's called partial hydrogenation. So let me just show you that here. So some of these fatty acids can be heated up. So just heat in your frying pan, and then we can get a trans double bond out of it. So cis to trans. Naturally occurs cis. When they're cooked certain ways, they turn to trans. Certain oils are more prone to this than others. So one of the oils that is prone to trans the transferation, I guess you'd say, the partial hydrogenation are uh, canola and vegetable oil in particular are, are prone to, to turning to a trans double bond when you, when you fry them up. So I recommend using things like olive oil. Olive oil is less prone to this. You have to get it really, really hot to get it to do that. Where uh, your vegetable oil is doing that right in your pan easily or in your fat fryer for your French fries. Uh, I believe they use either canola or vegetable at the fast food place. They do not use olive oil. That's too expensive. Um, I don't know. Uh, the question was about avocado oil. I don't know. I, I, I just know in particular the oils that I personally avoid canola and vegetable as if they were sugar. Like, and I'm also avoiding sugar too. You'll, yeah, I keep saying that every day. We're going to go over that when during carbohydrates. But yeah, I, I avoid canola oil and vegetable oil as if they're sugar because they're bad for you. All right. Um, the last thing I wanted to go over was oxidations, and we are done with the chapter. Any questions? We're going to go over oxidations now. Yep, canola oil is dirt cheap. Use olive oil. Spend so uh, the way I feel about it is I feel I feel that quality food is an, an investment in yourself, and I think that yourself should be highly valuable to you. Should, you should think of yourself being highly valuable, and I feel that the more quality food that you give yourself, the more quality life you're going to have. So definitely eat the right foods, guys. It's worth the money. It's worth the extra few bucks to buy the good oil versus the bad oil. If you have the money, if, if, if you can afford it. Don't just try to save money, just save money. Save money because you have to, right? But if you can afford to buy the more expensive foods that are healthier for you, please do so. It's better for you. <laughs> I feel the same way about that, but I'm not sure how PC it is. But yes, I don't like to go to them either. I have stories, mixed feelings. Yeah, this is drama. Yeah, so I, I avoid it too. So I feel that the, so I'm going to get on my little soapbox here for a second. I, my goal is to be a 70 year old man on no medications. I'm currently on no medications and I want to stay that way. And I'm hoping that by my diet and exercise routine and all that, I can keep myself off of medication. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping with broccoli, I, I can, I can stave off diabetes, right? <laughs> All right, uh, last one I want to go over here is oxidation. Um, we're going to go ahead and do, um, let's just do ozonolysis real quick. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and choose a asymmetric alkene. We are not going over the mechanisms. 
Yeah, broccoli does not help with asthma. I'm sorry. I'm actually not even sure if asthma does affect diet is affected by diet at all. I'm not sure. I, I haven't researched asthma. No one in my family has it, so I haven't looked yet. I'm curious though if if, if diet has an effect on asthma. I bet it does in some way. Or, You are what you eat, right? Anyway, so looking at this problem here, so what this is doing here, it's effectively going to clip the double bond in half. So I do want to mention here before we get started uh, on this, uh, in organic chemistry, I'll, I'll go over this in more detail again when we get to the carbonyl chapter, uh, but for redox reactions, we I've already shown you guys this symbol. This is called reduction when you see that symbol. This is when you get new bonds to H, lose bonds to O. And then the other symbol we use is the oxygen O. This is an oxidation. And you literally just flip the two atoms here. So it's new bonds to O, lose bonds to H. Yep, just flip this elements there. And it can be either or of these. It doesn't have to be both, it's either or. Sometimes it's both, but either or. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what this is gonna do, is gonna, instead of having two, uh, the carbons having two bonds to carbon, each carbon gonna have two bonds to O instead. So I'm gonna add a little note here and then show you the product. Each bond, gets two bonds to O instead of C, like that. So it's effectively gonna cut it in half. So this side, this is the left side, it's basically this. I'm gonna draw the H in there so we can see that this, that's this H, like that. And then this side, I'm gonna draw a kind of angle to kind of think of it breaking in half, like that. So we essentially just clipped it right there. Some students will draw little O's in there too, like little two little O's to kind of show what the new bond is gonna look like. I've seen that very commonly, like that. And that's basically what's happening. All right. So this is called uh, ozonolysis or oxidative cleavage. So ozonolysis. So looking at the words here, we're so, we're so creative in science how we name things. So ozone, we're using O3 as ozone, and then lysis means split. So ozonolysis, also called oxidative cleavage. Like so. Um, it may sound kind of weird, like most people think, like, oh, wait, how do we actually do this in the lab? Don't you get ozone in the atmosphere? Like, how do we get ozone into a flask? Uh, it works out if you actually, uh, it's actually very easy to do to make ozone. Um, if you guys have ever, uh, ever ha like been near like an ele electrical spark and that, that there's a characteristic smell of like electricity sparking, that's actually ozone you're smelling. It turns out when you have electrical arcing and sparking, uh, it react, that causes O2 to become ozone. And that's a very characteristic smell of, of sparks and electricity is ozone. So what we do in the lab is uh, we actually had a setup at CSN where a student was doing undergraduate research and they were, they were doing ozonolysis reactions. And he took a long like, uh, like plastic tube and then like coiled uh, copper around it and then ran electricity through it and, and like oxygen and stuff. It was a really cool setup. But yeah, I remember he had a coil of copper going through it. That was for the electrical current. And, it, and all the ozone was entrapped in the glass, so it didn't go out into the room. Yes, O3 is ozone, yes. Right? Yeah, it's ozone, it's O3. You know what's interesting thing about ozone is like, I remember like back in the 80s when uh, people were like really worried about the ozone layer uh, falling or opening so ozone is good for the atmosphere. It's not good for the human. 
So if you breathe ozone, it's highly toxic. So yeah, don't breathe it in. Don't breathe the ozone if you're smelling a spark. Hi, Tristan. You're making a sad face. Mm. Yeah, because I thought it was going to be over. No, nope, not yet. Almost, almost. Almost done, buddy. He's like, I need to play Roblox now. Give him my Roblox. I need and I'm like, Roblox, give my kid back. I need <laughs> more back. What? <laughs> I'm not sure what he's even talking about. It's thick like you have to get more fat on the I was just talking about fat. I was talking about saturated and unsaturated fats. It was kind of cool. All right, um, I want to show you guys one more oxidative cleavage, and we are going to call it a lecture. So it works out where uh, same compound again. Uh, I'm not quite done yet by the gateway, guys. I still need to go over um, uh, anti-mark additions, and there's a few radical reactions. So um, yeah, I didn't get a chance today to get quite get that far. I don't want to go this long. So uh, one more reaction, then we're going to call it a lecture, guys. So. Uh, here we have uh, KMNO4. We're gonna say cold and hot first, or we're gonna do cold, the cold and hot versions. So if it's cold, you will get a syn dihydroxylation. That means that you added two OHS groups on there in the same direction. I'll write it out here, don't worry. It's, it's a syn dihydroxylation. So the way I would do that is uh, just make sure, just kind of imply that the OHs are in the same direction. So once again, sin dihydroxylation. So you basically added two hydroxyl groups in there. Like I said, we're so creative in naming stuff in science. So creative. All right, uh, we are not worrying about the mechanism here, guys. Don't worry, no mechanisms here for this one. So this is a syn dihydroxylation. And I do also want to point out here, this is an oxidation, technically an oxidation. We are getting new bonds to, car uh, to oxygen with carbon. Yep, exactly. So yeah, the, the comment was cold will add in while hot is going to denature or cleave. That is 100% correct. Uh, so it, it, it's actually really similar to the ozone olysis. So once again, same same setup. KMNO4, hot. And we get full cleavage and full oxidation also. So if you compare it to the last example, let me show you last example. So the last example, uh, this fragment became an aldehyde. The most notable difference here is that will actually oxidize. So it turns out that this can oxidize to a carboxylic acid. Please don't, Tristan. I'm almost done. And so once again, instead of getting the carboxylic acid or the aldehyde, we get a carboxylic acid. Let me compare right here. Uh, the other side cannot further oxidize. So I'm going to add that little comment here. So we get a carboxylic acid, we get a coo instead of a co. <laughs> coo instead of cho, I guess you say it that way. And then uh, this one here, uh, this cannot further oxidize. In these conditions. All right. Any questions about the permanganate? I'm gonna add a comment here. Uh, so this reaction in particular is not overly useful from the synthesis point of view. It is extremely difficult to control. Uh, permanganate is a very strong oxidizer. So sometimes even if it's cold, you'll still get cleavage anyway. Depending on, depending on the, there's a factor of concentration too that has an effect here. Uh, so in general, we don't typically use it for, uh, if you want to purposely get this compound, there are better ways to do it. Uh, I'm not going to cover it here, but I do cover it in 241. It's the osmium reaction. I'm not covering it here. The permanganate is good enough. And the reason why I want to cover just this one is because this is often used for staining. So this reaction 
is often used for how convenient. We went over this today, didn't we? TLC staining. So backing up like an hour to back to the TLC discussion, uh, it turns out that um, the other product from these reactions is MnO2. Let's write it over here. And it turns out that this MnO2 side product is brown. Where CAMNO4, if you recall from your freshman chemistry or second semester chemistry, you guys did a lab where you did a titration. It was a reduction titration. Sorry, oxidative titration it was, something like that. Anyway, permanganate within the barrette is purple. This is bright. It looks, it looks like uh, pomegranate juice or something. Yeah, it's purple. So what we do with the TLC plate is uh, if uh, typically we use a UV light, it, uh, but it turns out that if the compound doesn't have a lot of double bonds in it, we can't see it with UV. It's still invisible under UV. To make it appear, we oxidize it with permanganate. Most organic compounds can oxidize with permanganate. And what we do, we just, we just dip the plate in there, pull it out, and then brown spots appear on the plate. And that's what your TLC spots are going to be. Yep, exactly right. Yeah, the CAMNO4 is the violet liquid that we use in CAM122. That was the lab where you, you were determining the percent iron in an, iron, an unknown iron sample. Yeah, it's one of my favorite labs, actually, when I, when I teach 122. All right, um, um, next time, uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a quick list if you guys want to think about what to think about ahead. We're going to go over anti-mark addition. And that's pretty much it uh, with peroxides. Yep, that's all we have left to cover. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, do that next time, and I'll also work on the worksheet next time. So... Let me switch over. So once again, anti-mark addition with peroxide is all we have left to do. It's a radical mechanism. We are, we are going to go over that mechanism. It's a radical mechanism. It's so radical. <laughs> Just so radical. Yeah, radical mechanisms are ones that use half arrows. We'll go over that next time. Um, but I think we're done. Yay! Yay! Time for Roblox! Yay! Time for Roblox! Yay! Yeah! <laughs> Is that what you're yelling about? Mm. Or do you want to hear after I'm done? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just stop the stream here. I'll, like usual, I'll, I'll be around Discord and stuff. And other than that, I'll see you tomorrow. Have fun studying today, guys. Do you have chemical and Roblox? No, we don't. He plays Piggy. I don't play any Piggy anymore. You sure you don't play Piggy? I think you play Piggy still. What are you playing nowadays? Come here. Um, build up game. It's where you have to keep clicking, 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 and then you can do fights or races, um, and then you can get, and then you're gonna get on top of the leaderboard, and then that's really high because it's usually like a QA. Yeah, if you if you guys ever play like Minecraft, uh, basically like people make their own maps and games and stuff, and then other people go in there and play. Yeah, it's basically like I, I don't know like. It's, it's really like Minecraft and Fortnite together, <laughs> kind of. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut the stream here. Uh, everybody stay safe, stay sane, and then yep, ask me questions in the Discord. All right, have a good one, everybody. Please don't get corona. Yeah, please don't get corona.